All right, welcome everybody. Uh, glad to see so many of you here in attendance today. My name is Arnaud Siad. Uh, forgive the French accent, I'll try to keep it in check. <laughs> I'm communication advisor at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo and host of Prio's podcast, Peace in a Pod. And it's fair to say that in a few short months, we've all become acutely aware of how artificial intelligence is no longer a topic of science fiction. Perhaps some of us here concerned about our own jobs with ChatGPT. I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> but just generally wondering if we are witnessing a giant leap into a new world. And recently I went to see Oppenheimer at the movies, like many of you did this summer. And I read an interview afterwards where the director of the movie, Christopher Nolan, said that AI scientists refer to artificial intelligence as their Oppenheimer moment. And there are many remarkable similarities between the father of the atomic bomb and, say, the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, who famously left Google earlier this year so he could freely speak about the dangers of artificial intelligence. And basically, both express concern about a sort of a Frankenstein moment, right? Like, what have we created? And there is, in fact, a great scene in the movie, no spoiler, it's all in the history books, where basically Oppenheimer talked to President Truman, and, you know, he feels like he has blood on his hands, and Truman says to him, you know, you're just a crybaby. So the three of you sitting here today, my question to you, of course, a bit provocatively, is... Are you crybaby scientists? Should we be worried about AI? And what does it even look like in a war zone today? Because I feel like it's a lot of buzzwords, but we don't really quite know what we're referring to when we talk about AI in, in warfare. So we are joined today by Cecilia Hellesweit. She is a jurist and an international law expert. She's part of the Norwegian Academy f of International Law, and she's worked as pre or before as a researcher. We are also joined by Henrik Sisse, who is a research professor at PRIO, and he specializes on ethical questions related to armed conflicts, and is a former member of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. We are also joined by Samar Abbas Nawaz. He's a doctoral researcher at PRIO. He's also a lawyer, and he specializes on the intersection between law and technology. So welcome to the three of you. And you're all researchers on AI, but you come at it from different angles. So what I'd like to know is basically where you stand on the, this issue by asking you a simple question. What keeps you up at night when you think of AI and warfare? And starting with you, Cecilia. Thank you very much. Now, I will start by bragging about myself. I'm so sorry Please about go this. ahead. In 2016, I was an international expert in, in the CCW in The Hague, reflecting on this issue about artificial intelligence, autonomous weapons, and international law. So I have been reflecting on this for quite some years already. Which brings me to the question, and I have three things that I'm worried about. First, I'm worried about how military activity will look like in the domains that are not limited by borders, meaning naval domain in the seas, in outer space and in cyber, because that is not where you have sovereign borders. And when you have autonomy, and not two or three major nations, but a number of nations with a capability of military activity way beyond their borders, the risk of armed conflict between nations is going to rise dramatically, one. Two, how do we deal with the encounter between machines and lawful human targets? Do we basically say that machines are allowed to kill humans if humans resort to perfidy and they try to mock it or fool the machine? Should we program our machines to say humans cannot be trusted? What do we do with that type of development? And thirdly, machine war. When we look at intercontinental space programs that are basically uh, made for machine war, where do we leave human beings and ecological systems in that equation if escalation goes to what? Now, note one thing, I'm not worried about civilian casualties. Why? Hmm. Because I be believe that is a collateral damage of autonomous war warfare, and that is not where the main problem lies, unfortunately. 
Hmm, interesting. Henrik, same question to you. Thank you. I, I already had things keeping me up at night, and now I got more. <laughs> uh, seriously, we are talking about uh, truly difficult things. So if I am to say one thing, it would be the thing that distinguishes this from the Oppenheimer moment. The atomic bomb, incredibly dramatic. A weapon of mass destruction that can essentially destroy the world. But still analog. Hmm. Uh, still possible to understand. I mean, the physics are difficult but it's still something that you can actually literally touch. Here we are facing a sort of technology where we are not quite sure in which direction it's moving. And through exactly what you talked about, through moving into uh, all kinds of networks that we don't fully understand that are digitalized, it's harder for us to know what the results are. So if you are to sit down and create a treaty that regulates this, it's relatively easy to know what you're regulating when it's chemical or biological or atomic weapons. In this case, it's a lot harder. So I would think that would be uh, an indication of what I worry about, and then I can come back more to the details later. Fascinating. Samar? Thank you so much, uh, and thank you everybody for joining us here. Um, what keeps me up at night, or what I find really troubling, is um, this uh, nexus between civil and military uh, transfer of technology. Um, when we talk about military arms and everything, traditionally, yeah, we could have uh, dichotomized these two sectors, but now it's not so possible. AI is transferred from civil sector to military sector in ways that are more subtle and, and it happens more often. Um, and what's more important here is regulation or the lack thereof. Um, it's important to, as, as my <coughs> co-panelists also referred to, autonomy, you know? Uh, what kind of systems are we making what AI are we envisioning? There's so much push to make these systems independent, or you can say autonomous, uh, that, that we are slowly considering human element to be somewhat, uh, we are underestimating it. Uh, we want human to be there somehow, you know, intervening into the system. Well, that's an intervention, that's not control. And, and so when we start thinking about the design of these systems, we find that so much is put into the, uh, the, the design of these systems, into the codes of it, that if we let these systems be, it's going to be a trouble for us. And um, what's important here, as I said, in design, we are already seeing what's happening in, for instance, these large language models. These language models are really great at syntax, the structure, but they don't understand the context of the discussion. And, and we tend to anthropomorphize these systems as if they are humans. I think this is very important. This is the message that I would like to convey, that stop anthropomorphizing them. These are, these are language models, they are limited. Stop imputing these uh, terminologies as autonomous or something sentient. These, are, these systems are not. Um, and we can only do that once we delve into the design considerations of these systems and uh, start regulating them. Thank you. Right. Could I add one small thing there? Please because I think the term artificial intelligence leads us to thinking of something that's akin to our intelligence. As a philosopher, I prefer to think of intelligence as something that's sentient. So I actually prefer the term artificial computational intelligence, mm -hmm. just to point out that it's a computational element, not the sentient element. I realize I've lost on the terminology, <laughs> but it's important to keep in the back of our minds. However, they can come across to us as sentient, and then we're opening a big business there too. Sure. Sorry. No, no, but terminology is super important, and I think, of course, I mean, today's topic is about the future of warfare with AI, but I think it's important to just brush over what, AI looks like in warfare today. So maybe can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, I think um, we have the first, uh, let's say, uh, authoritatively use, authoritative use uh, of uh, autonomous drones was in Libya in 2020, and it was used by Turkey. This was then uh, concluded by the Security Council Committee on Sanctions. And from that moment on, I think there has been quite a lot of uh, use of autonomous systems in some of the war theaters we, we have around the world, P probably previous prior to this, but it hasn't been confirmed. Now, that is a part of uh, the, the very rapid development that we have currently on the battlefield. This goes to l the Libyan uh, theater of war, the Yemeni uh, theater of war, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Syria, and not to mention Ukraine. Now, we see Ukraine as a classical uh, industrial dirty war, but some parts of it 
is basically a testing ground for autonomy as well. And I think this is moving very, very quickly into the next phase of modern warfare. So it's moving fast, very fast these days. Interesting. And I think in one of our conversations together, you mentioned that something that I didn't think of as AI, but Israel's Iron Dome, would that be considered a kind of a... It's an autonomous, well, it's an automatic system. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a defense system where you have already predetermined which areas are going to be protected. Mm -hmm. And once there is a massive attack of uh, missiles or very cheap rockets coming from Gaza, for instance, into Israeli society, they, you turn on the switch mm. and it will just shoot down all of these, these uh, rockets that are hitting certain targets. But it means, and this I, I would just tell you about this, because in the, in the war in 2021, uh, what the Israeli society experienced was that when the rockets kept falling, people in Israel who are paying their bills, who think that they are going to be protected by the Iron Dome system, they realized that the Israeli authorities had been selecting areas that were not protected. So those villages and towns that were actually attacked by the Palestinians were the Arab Israeli communities. And they were not angry with the, with the Palestinians and Hamas. They were very angry with Israeli authorities. So you had this escalation internally almost to, a, it wasn't civil war, but it was a huge security problem inside of the Israeli society mm. because of the decisions made preemptively by the Israeli military. And these are some of the dynamics that autonomy will introduce into our societies that will make military, use of military power affect our societies in different ways. Right. And you mentioned the term automated. And I think that's very key here because when we think of AI, we tend to think of it as something that is perhaps autonomous, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess, I think, Henrik, you've argued that there is a spectrum of sort of intelligence mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, lethal machines. Can you perhaps explain the difference, what we mean when we say autonomous? What do we mean? Well, it depends a bit on which viewpoint you take, because if you take it from the viewpoint of the user, a lot of things come across to me as autonomous. They're not, but I don't understand them. The GPS in my car, <laughs> even our new stove, it does things I do not understand. So it comes across me, it's clear they're not autonomous. So there's a gliding scale. And once again, we have this question, is it really autonomous at all in the way we think about it in philosophy mm -hmm. as someone making up their mind by weighing different options? Probably not. But what it could do is to make decisions that are not pre-programmed because it's learning from its own programming. And then gradually it becomes more distance from the original programming and the original decisions made by human beings and more advanced. And if this happens really quickly, we talk about in weapon systems autonomy. So if you think of a swarm, for instance, lots of different drones flying and they're communicating with each other and they're suddenly seeing a new point to attack. We have never told it to attack, but on the basis of what is learned from before, this could be a target. That's when we moved into that. And physically speaking, there are weapons around the world where you actually have a switch, <laughs> more or less literally a switch, turn to autonomous mode. And I've talked to several high-ranking people in uh, NATO militaries who said we never turn on that switch. Not yet. But that's also because we're afraid of being sued afterwards. But we are moving into a time and a technology where this is possible. Right. And you mentioned, you know, GPS and the, the type of stuff that we all use on a day-to-day -day basis. And somehow I'd like to turn to you now because you specialize on autonomous civilian drones. And I guess the question is, is the separation between military and civilian use of AI clear-cut? Or is it becoming blurrier? Uh, it's pretty blurry. It, it's quite blurry. We cannot, as I said earlier, we cannot dichotomize these, uh, these systems as, oh, this is civilian and this is military. Yeah, in, it, it differs in terms of application. Um, and uh, already, um, I, I forgot to mention earlier, like when, when we talk about this transfer of technology to different uh, in different areas, we can take an example of these large language models, for instance, mm -hmm. which are used for chat GPT. Now, Google is using them in their physical robots. They are using the same models to make the robot move and, and perform some actions, physical actions, detecting objects and everything, using the same models, which are full of hallucination, which are full of issues. Um, 
in civilian uh, these these models we we use the term like it, it's it's a it's a normal term it's it's not a bad word it's it's a bullshit system mm -hmm. it bullshits so the thing is uh can we just rely on them in terms of using them in our you know military sector or anything more important mm -hmm. um so so an important thing here is to consider when we talk about as you said you know cry baby scientist uh, it's very important that we understand I personally am not afraid of their intelligence. I'm afraid of their stupidity uh, because that's what these systems are. And when they are embedded into our different areas, especially military, and we are not able to pierce through what exactly uh, was the reason behind certain action, we would always have some problems. So, so that's what needs to be to be understood. So, yeah, no, <laughs> I don't think that there is this dichotomy that it, it's it's not viable at all. Right, right. And Cecilia, you are a legal scholar, and for our audience, what is currently the existing legal framework around AI? What is regulating AI out there in the battlefield, if anything? Well, we don't have a treaty for AI uh, or autonomous weapons, and we won't have one <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's a vacuum, because when you don't have specific rules, then the general rules apply. So there are three basic let's say, frameworks of international law applicable to autonomous weapons and uh, support systems. And it's the UN Charter. You cannot use autonomous weapons outside of your territory against uh, the interests or of, of another state or the sovereignty influencing the political uh, independence of another state. That is point number one. Then point number two, once you rely on autom autonomous weapons, when you are, in fact, taking part in an armed conflict, you are bound by humanitarian law, the laws of armed conflict. Point number three, if you operate an autonomous weapons outside of an armed conflict, you are subject to human rights law, meaning that there is a very, very strict uh, standard for taking human lives. So you need to apply to these three sets of rules anyhow. The problem, of course, is that when you rely on autonomous intelligence gathering systems that will yeah. inform you that everything is fine and now this is the person you want to kill, the soldier does not have human intelligence or other sources that can kind of overrule the machine, so the machine will basically <coughs> dictate who will live or die anyhow. And then, of course, you have the machines doing the killing themselves. So it's th there are very difficult ways of seeing while we will keep human control over this. So this brings the entire legal framework into a new, let's say, landscape. Right. Mm -hmm. But somehow we are seeing in the EU right now some sort of regulatory framework around the civilian use of AI. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, what are those and are they applicable to warfare? The most important restriction is basically that the AI Act of the EU, including all those types of restrictions that we have, the Chinese also have a, have a, have a new law uh, regulating AI, is not applicable to military use. And this is, of course, one of the things that they are you know, quarreling about uh, in the suggestion how to delineate what is actually military use. Yeah, I, I agree with her. And, and another important point to add here is that these regulations are still at a proposal stage um, and it's so complex to regulate these systems because as, as uh, Henrik rightly pointed out it's very difficult to first of all understand them and then to regulate them it's very difficult uh, I'm a part of some some, some body and and uh, in, 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 we in terms of uh, regulating these uh, autonomous systems I'm not sure if I can actually uh, disclose that publicly but what's important here is that even in those discussions, it's so difficult to come up with the right kind of terminology and to to actually regulate that in the way that it would be more, um, uh, you could say, satisfactory for the for the overall regulatory framework. For instance, how do you define autonomy? How do you say certain thing is autonomous? Do we do we use the spectral approach as we are saying? Okay, yeah, we have a spectral approach to a varying degree that it's it's showing some kind of intelligent. Uh, behavior, but then how would you classify that? Because mm. then you you open up different discussions, and it's so it's very complicated. I would say mm. yeah, it's it's not so easy. In the CCW, uh, which is kind of the normal forum to to prohibit new conventional weapons in the Geneva uh, in Geneva, mm. they have been quarrelling about this since 2017 <laughs> or 16, 
and one of the main uh, discussions has been about how do you define an autonomous weapon. Well, it isn't a weapon. It's a quality in a weapon. So basically, you have a very, very small weapon, and it can become autonomous, or you have intercontinental ballistic missile or even you know, space programs that can become autonomous. So it isn't really definable in the same way that we are used to. And of course, some people uh, suggest that this quarrel about definition is just a way of keeping regulation <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what they do in Geneva, quarrel. They, <laughs> they, should, they should come to our dog. Uh, I just want to latch on to something Cecilia said earlier that's really crucial to this whole debate, not primarily the legal, but the moral and, well, in many ways legal as well. Uh, that's what we call in everyday language data bias, namely when you get advice from a machine and you presume it's smarter than you are, you do what it says. You can go back to the DPS. Some of you use that in your cars, right? And it gives you advice about going somewhere. You go, mm. that's wrong, but I'll do it anyway because the machine is smarter than I am. And this is a really serious problem because, as you said, you will have soldiers making life or death decisions based on machine input. Mm. How do you actually make sure that that machine input is right? Well, the optimists in the debate, they are what we call in philosophy utilitarians. They believe that, well, if it overall works better, then it's okay. So it's the same thing with driving less cars. Whew, we're really scared about that, aren't we? But if they can show that mm. overall there will be fewer accidents with driverless cars than with human drivers, we'll say, well, overall it's probably good, even though there will be individual cases where the machine will make mistakes, partly because it's not sentient, that a human being would not make. I think that's a scary argument in many ways because the effects, what we often call the cascading effects of making a mistake in a system that works so incredibly fast is much larger than in a human networking system because it'll spread much more quickly. So it mm. takes half an hour before you notice that this mm. swarm made a mistake. Mm. Then the errors in the meantime and the way it spreads will be much more serious than in a pure human networking system. And the autonomous enemy has, of course, responded that's, by that's that time. There you go. And right, there right, you right. Are. Right. Go ahead. No, because the question is, does, is it possible for the international community today to regulate this? I think it is, actually. Mm. But how do you get countries, I mean, think of, for example, cluster bombs. It's been in the news recently. I think you wrote an op-ed on this as well. A couple, I would say, yeah. <laughs> and basically, they are being used right now in Ukraine. They've been used for a while. And essentially, I believe Ukraine, Russia, and the United States did not sign on the, yes. the sort of uh, treaty that already exists surrounding that use. And that tells us that basically even if you have a regulatory framework, how do you get those big countries to agree to something that might not be in their But you do, interest? because it is in their interests. That is the, the flaw. Now, the thing about cluster munition, th those are kinds of autonomous as well, because, you know, you they basically, once you throw them off, they will do what they yep. can, and some of them will not explode. They have a high dud rate. They will penetrate into the earth, and they will come up, not the next day, but 10 years later, mm. and uh, some child will then explode. And it's kind of autonomy. Mm. It's just not targeted in the same way. Now, those are dirty weapons that we have basically left. Now we are using them because the Ukrainians are desperate and because there are minefields and they need to get right. behind enemy lines. That is the reason. It's an old discussion. What we are talking about is the new. And we don't, as, as Henrik said, we don't really have this entire good overview of what the problems are going to be. Mm. And this is an interest that all major and minor military powers in the world share. Nobody knows where this is heading, but it's heading in a direction that can potentially, you know, harm us all. So uh, there is this shared view increasingly yeah. that we need to take some control because we do not want a new Oppenheimer moment. We do not want to uh, make technology that can then not be unmade. And I know that you have this thing from the Americans that they have, they're saying. Uh-huh. They will advocate. Which is that they basically said that the current le legal framework around uh, AI is sufficient that uh, they, they must be designed to ensure appropriate levels of human judgment over the use of force. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean when the US is saying the existing framework is sufficient? It can be interpreted in two ways. One, the Americans don't want regulation. Or <laughs> it can mean the American state believes that the rules that I was talking about already apply to autonomous weapons. 
And if you don't get your act together and get into some, you know, legally bounding path, we mm. will apply what is here. It means that it is already regulated. And in ways that a l number of major military powers will not have because it will restrict their ability to rely on these weapons too much. Right, right. And I was struck by something you said about those cluster bombs, right? That they're not necessarily, I mean, of course, they're harmful in the moment, but some of them don't explode right away. They explode further down the road. And uh, Henrik, uh, a, a sentence struck with me in, in a paper you wrote where you said to be killed by a machine decision would debase warfare into mere slaughter as, th as though the enemy combatant were on par with an animal killed in an automated conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. So this is not your argument, but you're basically summarizing uh, a thought in the debate around warf warfare and AI, mm -hmm. saying that you know, in order to preserve human dignity, a human should only be killed by a human. Mm -hmm. The, re the reason I don't fully agree with it, and I, thank you for bringing it up, because it brings our attention to something truly important. In itself, I, I don't think it makes a difference whether you are killed by a machine or a human being. I huh. think that's a sort of quasi-argument, and uh, uh, I think it also has led parts of the debate down the wrong roads. But what it reminds us of is something a colleague of ours, Kjell Wegland, once wrote, uh, uh, namely that this whole debate about artificial intelligence reminds us of what is in literature called the uncanny. Has anyone here read Edgar Allan Poe, for instance? You know, when you read something and you don't quite understand what it is, I think that's the sentiment that this argument is trying to convey, that we are moving into something here that's a different sort of sphere, whereas war previously is something quite well known. Terrible, we don't want it to happen, but we more or less know what it is. But in these cases, we won't really know. Let's say the power grid is cut off from all of Arndal now. Do we know what is happening? There is something fishy. And I think that's what that argument is trying to get across. And the positive side of that argument is that we could <coughs> use that, hopefully, to tell the leading powers of the world that this is such a special domain that you have to work together in your own interest on regulating this. And this has happened before in human history. I think it's an interesting um, example during the space race that the Soviets and the Americans realized that we have a common interest. So even though we're on this race to space, to the moon, let's create a treaty that says we are to do these things together. And that actually succeeded. We've had 50 years of peaceful collaboration between Soviet Union first, then Russia and the United States, because they realized it's in our common interest. Unfortunately, falling apart now, but we need these arguments where it's lock off certain things and say, here, we do need collaboration because we are faced with something that's different. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to pick up on that because you know when there is an armed conflict, what is a military objective? Oh, is this green uh, car that the soldiers are using and their military bases and these are kind of, no, no. A military objective is what has a function for the military uh, effort. And when you rely on cyber or on electronic warfare or autonomy, you rely on electri electric, electric grids in a different way than, than mm. in, in common warfare, which means that the entire electric grid of a society becomes exactly a military objective. And this is also some of the things we're seeing in Ukraine. Increased electronic warfare means that you destroy electricity in a society because it is not civilian, it becomes a military objective. And this is one of the, let's say, un wanted effects of the next era where we will have much more catastrophic side effects for our societies when if we were to engage in those types of autonomous let's say uh, battles because it will it will decimate our societies right right and it's yeah, just, to, just to be on the dark side <laughs> because, you know. and this is one of the reasons why states are increasingly prepared to do some regulation I just want to say one more thing. We have another example of a technology that was developed by civil actors, yeah, used in society to improve society at large, and then became prohibited, which is chemical weapons. Mm. This was the yeah. reason why we have the industrial, in, in, industrial revolution. 50 years later, it found its way into the battlefields. Yeah. When, they, when it reached Europe, they realized what it did, and they said, no more chemical weapons on the battlefield. Second World War? Did all the major powers have chemical weapons in their depositories? No. Yes, they did. Did they use it? No, they didn't. This is not unheard of. This is entirely possible. Right. 
Okay, and we've talked a lot about, you know, the kind of traditional warfare in the battlefield, but you mentioned that, of course, electric grids have been a target uh, in Ukraine and, 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 and in war zones, and that's also because, obviously, in, we are in the digital age, and social media is used as a tool in warfare, and we have this uh, powerful sort of, well, something that has become weaponized, which are, of course, algorithms, right? So you have this tool generating and amplifying this information, and we've seen that in the war in Ukraine. So I've looked at the research, and for example, they found out that any new subscriber to TikTok will be exposed to false information within 40 minutes of its use. <laughs> Another research found that Facebook algorithm routinely was kind of spreading information without saying that this was a conspiracy theory. So these are things that we are all exposed to, and we... I mean, is there any regulation around this? And uh, how do you go about regulating algorithms? I, 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 <laughs> can, I, can I just start and then I will leave the main Please thing for the gentleman? Because I think that is perhaps one of the most challenging dimensions of today's situation. Because when we talk about autonomy in the military domains, we're not really talking about the information domain, but that is obviously where the main you know, action is taking place. And the information domain has almost no limits, at least not in our societies, be because this is how we basically define ourselves. We're open societies, we're democratic societies, which means that we expose ourselves to the non-democratic societies that are able to protect their own societies because they have walls, but they can play on our part of the field, and they can do so with a lot of detrimental effects for our own social fabric. And this is, I think, perhaps the greatest danger that we are currently living through. Mm. I have no idea how, we, how we're going to solve it, uh, but this is perhaps where the most important and dangerous challenge from autonomy is currently here, because this is already here. Mm -hmm. It is not five years, 10 years, 15 years, it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, if you combine the aspects of surveillance and information, you of course get also a pretty scary picture as you point out. I mean, if you just do a simple thought experiment, which is kind of chilling, if you put yourself back to the 1930s and you see a leader like Hitler and his propaganda minister Goebbels, and then you imagine that they have access to modern bio and gene technology, modern artificial intelligence, modern digitalized communication technology, they essentially win. <laughs> Uh, and we see these things happening several places around the world, not as seriously as with a Hitler, but obviously we are seeing things in the way in which China manages to actually surveil large parts of its uh, population and even combine that with DNA registers of largely the whole population and then managing to find out where everyone is. Is that war? Is that military? No, it's not military application in the traditional sense, but as you point out, this could be an essential element in build up to war and in armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing? Please, and ahead. now we have to open the eyes. I mean, one thing is that the distinction between civilian and military, but we have to go way beyond that when we are in the information domain. Let's see, the most important information, disinformation campaign against Sweden was in 2021, in January and February. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the, with the Swedish Bornevarna, the child care institutions in, in Sweden. It was the most wide... Uh, and dramatic information, disinformation campaign, and it was partly run from Egypt, <laughs> from a preacher in Egypt with access to a number of internet, you know, uh, tools, <laughs> and with with uh, with the kind of artificial intelligence w that we have now, you can also translate back and forth into flawless language, which means that we are exposed from a number of actors around the world and what we do to our open societies to protect ourselves against that without becoming China. Mm. Yeah. And it's incredible how pervasive this is. It's not just algorithm, right? We're talking also about chatbots and deepfakes. I was absolutely stunned last time I was in my home country, France, and there is on the, the main channel this show that it took me a few seconds to understand these were deepfakes. This was not actually Emmanuel Macron talking to Marine Le Pen. But the fact is, this is going on every evening on French television. You can tell it's fake after a while, but to the gullible and perhaps someone who is just not really, you know, seeing through it, 
you might believe this is true. Mm. And it is completely unregulated. There is no mention of, careful, this is a deep fake. And so I'm kind of wondering, uh, perhaps to you, Samar, um, do you have any thoughts about how these could be regulated as well? Um, it's, I think they can be regulated if uh, there's a political will and if uh, efforts are directed towards things that matter. Mm. As I said, design. Yeah. Let's not be reactive. Let's be proactive. Mm. Let's talk about what goes into these systems. How come these systems, how are these systems able to do all these things? Chat GPT has gone to a point where it is able to be used as a facial recognition technology. It was supposed to be a chatbot, but now we are reaching that stage. And that is, that's what happens in the vacuum of regulation, as, as it's happening in the U.S., uh, in EU, we are still trying to, you know, regulate these things. But again, coming back to that international regulation point, it doesn't matter. Chat GPT is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Europe, you're still trying to come up with regulations. But the, the, the nature of this technology, this new <laughs> alien, is that it's, it spreads out so quickly that you cannot just think about it in a, in a compartmentalized way. So I'm uh, my view is that it, there has to be some international uh, action around it. I mean, there recently uh, UN started this uh, multi-stakeholder group, uh, which is let's see how that goes. But this had to be done yesterday, <laughs> and and we are still here. And just one last point about autonomous. It's very interesting that we are talking about autonomous uh, weapons and we use the term autonomous. But you know what? Uh, many of these countries would not use the word autonomous at all. Why? Because they would have they would define word autonomous mm -hmm. as something where human is not able to intervene at all. Well, they would put someone with a big red button, <laughs> whatever that is, and they would let, that's not an autonomous system. That is just completely non-autonomous. Why? Because somebody's sitting there and trying to control it through just one button. And as Henrik rightly pointed out, the, the stimulus, uh, you are not able to react to certain things in the right order. So there's so much politics behind these terminologies used. There's so much going on that I think an, an international uh, action needs to be taken yeah. around it. Mm -hmm. can we, uh, please, Cecilia, and I can come No, in. I just, uh, I actually share some of the optimism when it comes to the EU, because I, I do believe if you look at the last, you know, 10 years, uh, some of the regulation in terms of uh, digital challenges has come first in the EU, and then the rest of the world has kind of copied that I in mm -hmm. a way the Americans and the Chinese but ad adopted and adjusted to their own needs. And I think that the, the, the new AI regulation, which is basically for civilian uh, technology, but you know most of this technology origins in civilian life and is then weaponized or militarized, and there you will basically have some type of uh, technologies that will be prohibited mm. and some that will be very, very restricted. And that means that we will have institutions in all European countries including in Norway, I hope, <laughs> uh, stashed with very competent people that will have a yeah. discussion about what right. can we, why should we prohibit this technology, and those types of documents and discussions will kind of leap into the military domain as yeah. well. I yeah. very much believe so. So yeah. the EU, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> yeah. is the savior, actually, on this uh, point. I, I've so always so. felt that way. Do you know how <laughs> I'll, I'll, leave I'll, I'll leave that debate aside, most definitely. I know we're getting towards the end here, so I just yeah. want to make two quick points. First, on behalf of Prio, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. There are many more Prio panels coming up later during on, but I'll see uh, Uka as well. And, uh, uh, but two quick points. Firstly, the one on control, where human control seems to be someone with a red button, but it's not really... <laughs> control in the sense of being able to stop something if it started. So therefore, the standard terminology that is being used in the debate is meaningful human control. Lots of debate about that as well, but that's kind of become the buzz phrase. The other thing I want to say is, after having talked about this, you can ask the question, why on earth would you want any sorts of military technology of this kind at all, <laughs> since it's so dangerous? But let us remember that there are things that these sorts of technologies can help a military do in a better way according to international law. And there is a famous abbreviation for that in military circles, the triple D. Dull, dangerous, and dirty work. There is a lot of dull work that takes a lot of time, intelligence gathering, that you can be doing for international law and ethics reasons. You want to find out where civilians are. And it's dangerous because you're trying to clear minefields. And it's dirty. 
So you don't really want to bring your soldiers there. So let us remember that as well. Therefore, the regulation cannot only be about the things we prohibit, even though those are many, but also about the things we actually allow and to make sure there's a good legal reg regulation for that. Otherwise, different nations will not see it in their self-interest to contribute to regulation. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Henrik. And I think that's a good time for any questions from the audience. Everything is absolutely clear. <laughs> no. <laughs> Please, gentlemen over there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, shall I introduce myself? Please My go ahead. My name is Rasmus Raske. I work for Norwegian People's Aid, NPA. And uh, we do work on this issue um, from the perspective of uh, regulation. We're part of a civil society campaign called Stop Killer Robots. Um, we do believe that regulation is uh, desirable and, uh, and possible. And uh, I wonder if Cecilia could elaborate a bit on avenues uh, towards regulation, because recently I heard a podcast with you where you said uh, that uh, an additional protocol to the Geneva Convention could be one way in which we could regulate this. Just to give a bit more uh, background, now we're talking about regulating the autonomous weapons, not artificial intelligence in general, but uh, only the weapons or the weaponization of such technology when it's used to uh, kill or, or destroy uh, things. You know? And uh, maybe an additional question, could there be other ways uh, or other avenues to, to regulate uh, autonomous weapons and an additional <laughs> Triple barrel questions. <laughs> Who's ready for this? Well, I'll, I, I've just written an, a chapter in a book on military autonomy on precisely that issue. So I will just very, very briefly lay that out. Now, I think in terms of regulating autonomous weapons, meaning that autonomy is then a quality in a weapon. So you don't define autonomous weapons because you won't get nowhere. But I think that there are three, three p possibilities. Now, one is a uh, UN treaty where the major or all states in the world come together to agree on certain things. You cannot use the quality of autonomy, for instance, on platforms that apply weapons of mass destruction, for instance, as a point of departure where everyone can agree, and then to take it from there. So certain areas that you actually agree on. The problem is that you open this can of worms when you get into this. So I don't think it's very, very... Uh, sensible or even realistic that that will be done. The second possibility uh, is to go into the Geneva Conventions. Uh, the four mm -hmm. Geneva Conventions have three protocols, and you can have a fourth protocol. This will be limited to armed conflict, so it would only apply in situations of armed conflict. Now, we have more armed conflicts in the world now than at any time after the Second World War, so it will apply in many, many countries and in all of those theaters where these weapons are increasingly being tested. That is a good thing, so you would basically then actually have real impact. Now, uh, at that point, you could basically agree on quite a lot of things that states already agree on. That is the, the second possibility. Some of the problems will be to the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, who would then be kind of on top of it, and a number of actors would be very unhappy with that for a number of reasons, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the ICRC has never been really good at regulating weapons because when the ICRC said this weapon is prohibited, it at the same time says that this way of killing and maiming massively mm. is allowed yeah. and the ICRC cannot live with that. So probably somebody else should take that out and, and be responsible right. for it. Now the third possibility is a more CCW framework convention where you take the convention, conventional conventional weapons, the CCW, and you create a separate framework convention for autonomy, mm -hmm. meaning that all the states and major technology companies in the world will come together, sit in, let's say, Oslo Arnold. or wherever, <laughs> Arnold, yeah. every year come together and look at how the technology is developing and should there be prohibition for this and this specific technology for that and that specific platform. Yeah. And then you would basically have two separate avenues, one for autonomy and one for conventional weapons separate. And then you can also take all of those lessons learned mm -hmm. from the CCW and integrate it into that framework convention. We have quite a lot of suggestions of how that might be done. So there are <coughs> possibilities, but I mean, uh, and I think with last year in 2022, uh, in the autumn of 2022, there was a resolution, well, no, it wasn't a resolution, it was a declaration in the General Assembly at the UN where 70 states and the major ones, the most important ones, said, we need to do something yeah. about regulating this. So there is not a lack of 
mm. will actually among yeah. the major military actors. Mm. Somehow, one minute left. No, uh, yeah, oh, I just I was no? like, okay. uh, one minute left. It's all right. Um, good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. I believe we are running out of time. Yep. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. So many of you today. It's great to see. And uh, many thanks to our panelists, Samar, Henrik, and Cecilia. It's been a real pleasure and an honor to share this panel with you. And uh, please follow us on X, formerly Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> for your research. <laughs> and uh, wishing you all a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.